Uh, speaking of transnational existence, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Stephanie Maher with us today. She has taught at the Center for Jewish Studies at Basel University, where uh, she submitted her habilitation on the biography of Zalman Shoken. She's also been a postdoctoral fellow at the Rosenzweig Minerva Center here at Hebrew University and uh, is currently leading a multi-year project um, at the University of Bern on the history of academic refugees in particular between the year in Switzerland between the years 33 and 45. Um, she's also ideally suited to address us today because she's published extensively on the history of the Schocken Verlag in Berlin and also more generally on the rescue of Jewish books in the 1930s. Um, today we'll be pleased to hear from her uh, as she guides us through in particular the history and the design and the construction of the building where we are at the moment, but also the meaning of the library, including its art collection for Zalman Shokin personally. So Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me to speak here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it was said I've done my habitation on Salman Schocken, so I've been working something over six years on the bi biography of Salman Schocken, a project which I have completed something like a year ago. Um, I have spent countless hours, days, months, I don't know what, in this building, going through the very vast archive of Salman Schocken, his work and his library, and also, for instance, um, about his flowers. So I could now talk about the flowers, which um, maybe just very shortly. Um, the, the garden, this library had a garden as well. This was not a flower garden. Here he had um, berries, raspberries, blueberries, whatever, all imported from Germany. Um, the park and the garden of the private villa um, was the, the place with the flowers. Um, he had um, the tulip, for instance, um, imported from Holland. There is um, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, archive material on the gardens, including um, cards. Um, for every plant, there was a card, and you know they, they were noted. The gardener had to note how much water did it die, why did it die, what so on. So, if anyone wants to write about the flowers and the plants in the shock and gardens, the, the, the papers are here. So, just maybe a few personal words before I start. Um, it's quite special for me to talk today in this place. First of all, it's the, birth, the first birthday of my baby. And this due date um, was sort of my very personal um, deadline to finish this Shocken project. So I actually finished three weeks before he uh, was born and then revised the manuscript 10 days after he was born and submitted four months after he was born. So sort of it's this day today is important. Second, um, it's also sort of special for me to lecture in this room. I read about it. I worked in it while there were renovations going on downstairs. Um, I wrote about it, I published about it, and now for the first time I actually speak in it, and I will speak about it as well. So the quote I have chosen as a title, this room could not have been built in another place than Jerusalem. Um, these were Salman Shokin's words about this very room we are sitting right now. For Shokin, his library, the building, as well as the collection, was also the building, held a significance beyond just a mere like house or a storage place for his books and his art collection. I will talk about this a bit later, but we should keep it in mind um, because it might help us to understand why he put so much effort in every single detail of this library building. I will start talking with talking about the construction period of this building and highlight some aspects such as the functionality and the design. And I think we will hear much more about this um, in, the, in the next lecture. In the second part, I will dwell on the point I raised before, the meaning and significance of the building for Salman Schocken. And I will end with just a few words on the art collection. The book collection 
is topic of other presentations um, in the course of this conference, and therefore I will hardly talk about books. With one exception, when speaking about the significance of the library for Schocken, I will very swiftly touch on the subject, but without going into any details. I think this will all follow tomorrow. The planning and construction, construction of the library took more than two years. During this times, time, numerous problems arose, discussions, many of them frank, were led, fights were fought and decisions had to be made. Most of this found its way on paper in the form of letters, protocols, notes, and reports. There were daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports. Um, and all these papers are until, until today stored in about 35 archive boxes here in the Schocken Library. So the process can actually really be um, reconstructed quite in, in quite some detail um, with, uh, with the archive material here. So the planning of the library started as early as September 1934. This was about nine months after Salman Schocken, his wife and two of his five children migrated to the British Mandate of Palestine. At this time, Schocken had long decided to have his books, book collection shipped from Germany to Palestine. So he needed a place to keep his books and make them accessible to a selected group of researchers and readers. In the initial plans, Schocken wanted the library to be built adjacent to the family villa, which was planned at the same time. We know now today that um, this didn't happen. We have two buildings. After consulting with a number of architects, he decided to hire Erich Mendelssohn, um, who he worked with already in Germany, to plan and build the family home as well as the library building. At this time, the well-known German Jewish architect had not yet established his Jerusalem office. After Mendelssohn's flight from Germany in spring 1933 from Germany, he and his wife first settled in England, where he opened an office. Um, and it actually wasn't really the, the connection to Salman Schocken that brought him to Palestine, but the connection to Chaim Weizmann, the then Zionist leader and later president of the State of Israel. After getting more jobs in Palestine, Mendelssohn established his office in Jerusalem in 1935. But until 1933, he commuted, commuted between his two offices in Jerusalem and London, another example of that, that migration is not just a one-way one -way direction, that a lot of these German Jews who could afford it, who were connected in Europe until 38, sometimes until 39, commuted between um, the two continents. <laughs> So Mendelssohn is also one of the main protagonists of the story of this building. Um, but to his big dismay, he wasn't the only one, since he wasn't completely responsible for the construction of the two buildings. Salman Schocken brought Willi Heinze, a non-Jewish master builder and Baumeister, from his Zwickau office to Jerusalem to supervise the work and deal with the export office of the Schocken Concern in Germany. Mendelssohn took this as a personal offense. He suspected that Schocken didn't trust him fully as an architect, and as a Jew, he conceived it, I quote, as an injury to the Jewish sense of solidarity to bring a non-Jewish German to Palestine in the light of what happened in Germany. Um, you mentioned there was nichts to mecca, nothing to complain about, um, and it actually did turn out that Salman Schocken really, I mean, it turned out that he didn't trust his architect, but never in questions of design but in matters of build hours and cost management. After endlessly praising Mendelssohn and the library, he did this in lectures to other people, in speeches, um, he refused to pay Mendelssohn the full sum. Mendelssohn was forced to prove all his expenses and negotiate for months on end with Schocken. In terms of money, Salman Schocken was tough to negotiate with, to an extent which was perceived by others, for instance, also by Mendelssohn, as cruel. But let us look at the architecture very swiftly. Architectonically, Mendelssohn has designed the library building as a fusion between modernist European architecture and local traditions. In his architectural visions, which are published, Zionist architecture can never be a one-sided import of style. On the contrary, local building traditions have to be included. And Schocken enabled Mendelssohn, despite their many, many disagreements and conflicts, to plan this masterpiece. The Schocken Library, two pictures, was a very modern and functional building. 
but the small windows, the stone floors, as well as the Jerusalem stone, which was, was used for the facade, are references to the ori oriental building tradition. They are meant to keep the inner of the building cold in the hot Jerusalem summers. However, we can also find there may be first air conditioner in Palestine in this very building. So there are some pictures we can actually turn around. There in the back is part of the air conditioner. This not, this is new. Um, so we have really a fusion um, between the latest technical inventions, like the European technical inventions, modernist architecture and local knowledge. Mendelssohn's library building was not only an architectonical masterpiece, the building was highly functional. Different storage solutions were planned for the different collections and their needs. The books, the magazines and the manuscripts, as well as the art collection, were stored according to their needs in shelves and bookcases, which were designed and built especially for the purpose. Schocken, had all technical equipment, but also most of other building material imported from Germany. This is just one of the export um, papers. This made the building process very complicated and very long. There were a number of reasons to, why Schocken had um, the material imported. Um, he imported things like the glass for the windows, but also the wood, um, like screws, more or less everything you can see in this building. Things like this. This is really everything is from Germany. The lemon wood, I will talk about the lemon wood later. <laughs> um, so there were a number of reasons. First, by importing material from Germany, Schocken could save at least parts of his fi financial assets, which were frozen by the Nazis and could not be transferred abroad. The Nazis just froze all Jewish assets and you couldn't bring any money um, outside the country. Or if you did, you had to pay so much taxes that not, basically nothing was left. By the means of the Avara agreement and some individu individual deals, both with German and British authorities, Schocken was allowed to buy goods in Germany with his German money and export them to Palestine. This was, this was really simplified now. This is much more complicated. But this was a way to save um, some of the money. Second, Schocken requested only the highest quality material for his buildings. The sources show that Mendelssohn and Heinze did get, get into negotiations with local artisans and producers, but more often than not decided to import even the smallest items, such as, as it screws from Germany. Of course, local artisans, as well as the Histad Rut, the trade union of Jewish workers, were outraged at this decision. And more than once, the Histad Rut threatened that no organized labor will ever work for Schocken. Schocken refused to get into negotiations and simply believed that he will have no problem finding workers, and he was right. And he only worked with organized workers. This um, he was very clear about. Um, and the third reason for importing rather than buying locally was the matter of design. Mendelssohn had very clear ideas about, about the interior design. He not only planned the building, but also the interior. Chairs, you can see some of them here. Um, tables, these. the lamps you can see here. Coat hangers and so on were produced according to Mendelssohn's design and then shaped to Jerusalem. When you enter, you enter through the, the heavy front door, you get into the bright but rather cold foyer with the marble stairs leading upstairs. The windows are made of wavy glass, see it here, letting filtered light enter the building. If you now stayed on the ground floor and continued through the hall, you reach the custom-made chrome hooks for the coats um, and the hallway. Back then, the ground floor held the reading room and offices for the Institute of the Research of Hebrew Poetry, a research institute, as we heard, um, which was founded by Salman Schocken in Berlin and was then relocated to Jerusalem when Schocken himself left Germany. The heart of the library, however, is upstairs, the main reading room. If you walk up the marble stairs with the bronze handlebar designed by Mendelssohn, you reach this, the largest room of the building. And you can see um, left, this is Schocken, and this is um, in the UK. 
So this is a Mendelssohn design. Um, the tables, chairs, and lamps, as I said, in this room were designed by Erich Mendelssohn. The floors are held in beautiful marble, and the bookcases are made of lemon wood. Only a few pieces of furniture were placed in this room. Mendelssohn, Heinze, and Schocken spared no expense or effort for this hall. The furniture was produced in England and shipped to Jerusalem. The lemon wood for the bookcases was imported from Austria, and according to the sources, the question of the wood structure and surface had been discussed for over a year. The marble, however, the floors, was bought locally from the Sela, which was located in Beit Safafa and was founded in 1926 by the Zionist executive. So the marble floors are actually local. The lemon wood bookcases held only the most rare and the most important volumes of the Schocken Library. The rest of the library was stored in a multi-level um, book storage, which was as well imported from Germany. The reading room was not planned as a book magazine, but as, as we heard, as a venue for lectures and exhibitions. Salman Schocken himself elevated the significance and meaning of the whole. In 1937, on the occasion of Erich Mendelssohn's 50th birthday, which was celebrated in the Schocken Library, actually in the midst of their financial feud, Schocken declared that, I quote, this room could not have been built in a place other than Jerusalem, for the excuse to build it is only permitted here. It is primarily meant to be the so far only room in the world in which the Hebrew book can be shown in a dignified environment, end of quote. For Salman Schocken, his library was more than just a library. An unpublished article from around the time of the opening of the library ended with a quote from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 17. I quote um, from this um, article. The Schocken Library, located in the city of Jerusalem, plays an important part in the great movement of the Jewish Renaissance and symbolizes by its being transferred from the Gola to Palestine the idea of the children shall come home to their own border. It was most likely composed by one of his staff, the article members, with Schocken being the one deciding on the outline and doing last corrections. We have some corrections in it. So we can assume that the quote from the Bible was if it wasn't from Schocken, certainly not against his, um, his ideas. Jeremiah 31, 17 are words of comfort. It's the Lord speaking to Rachel. I quote, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for, the, for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come home to their own country. So um, you have Jeremiah here, and here you have um, the Schocken um, article. In the context of the Schocken Library, the books, or maybe being the children of Israel, dispersed in the diaspora, has a double meaning. They mean comfort in the sense that at least the Jewish books are being safe from the brutality of the Hitler regime, the land of the enemy. But the verse also gets a distinctive Zionistic interpretation. The Jewish books, the representative of the Jewish past and future are coming home to the land of Israel, coming home to Jerusalem. These books, which were collected in Germany and which were written and printed in the Galut, stand for the Jewish existence in general. They were sent from one place to another, traveled with their owners, and they were sold across borders. The books represent the ma many cultures Jews lived in, mirror their existence as minorities throughout different layers of time, there are the castle and monuments, a quote from another article, of the Jewish past. Schocken presents the shipping of the library from Germany to Eretz Israel in the terms of the Zionistic narrative of a national homecoming. The land of Israel is no longer an abstract entity, but a place on earth where the wandering of the Jews should come to an end. Jerusalem, the cultural and political center of Judaism, is the sec in the sec Second Temple period, is yet again in the course of being transformed into the center of Judaism. In accordance with a secular Zionist narrative, Schocken understands the new Jerusalem as first and foremost a cultural center from which the Jewish Renaissance will be emanating, and so he builds a unique house, a temple for his books. This room could not have been built in a place other than Jerusalem, for the excuse to build it, build it is only permitted here. 
The building with its modern features and beautifully furnished rooms received the function of a quasi-secular temple. Rare and beautiful manuscripts, early prints, as well as collections of photographic re reproductions of dispersed, dispersed texts and text fragments from all over the world were kept under its roof. Books and texts were to be the sources of a Jewish renaissance. Schocken mentioned in many occasions that only through profound knowledge of the history and the past traditions a Jewish future could be brought forward. The Hebrew collection, his Hebrew collection, um, served this purpose. According to Schocken, the establishment of the library was a homecoming of Jewish culture in the Zionistic sense. It was the establishing of a distinctive cultural Jewish space within the city of Jerusalem. I haven't yet addressed the artwork, because Schocken himself did write and talk a lot about his books, but never really about his art. But it was also, or at least parts of it, were kept um, in this building. Schocken not only collected books and manuscripts, he also owned a very fine collection of art. Schocken owned oil paintings by Van Gogh, Renoir, Cézanne, Pissarro, Corot, and Liebermann, and Pastel by Manet, and large watercolors by Chagall. Most of these paintings were hanged in the private villa, the big, very beautiful ones. The library, furthermore, more held original etchings, drawings, and watercolors by artists such as Schongauer, McKinnon, Dürer, Kahlo, Rembrandt, Liebermann, Munch, Menzel, Nolde, and Kete Kolowitz, and many, many more. For instance, M. Schocken's Kolowitz collection was one of the most valuable ones of the time. Schocken used to visit the artist in her studio where he bought graphic works directly from her. His collection included study, drawings, and printed graphic work. Some variations were not even included in the artist's oeuvre catalogue from 1955. Schocken furthermore owned a collection of rings, among them an Egyptian gold ring dating back to the time of the pharaoh, two Phoenician rings of the 6th century before the common time, rings from the earlier Greek and the later Greek or Roman time. Not to forget, Schocken also collected little figurines. There are samples of Mexican gold works from the Aztecs, little bronze animals from Egypt, as well as a Luristan bronze sculptures from the early Iron Age. This is a Luristan bronze, but not from the Schocken collection, just to have a picture. Like his books, Schocken had the largest part of his art collection shipped from Europe to Palestine during the 1930s. Whereas the book collection was sent from Germany, the paintings, or most paintings, as last the things I've seen, were kept in Swiss, obviously, bank vaults, from where they were transported to Jerusalem. When the library building was inaugurated in late December 1936, it not only held one of the ma most valuable private book collections in Palestine, but an also equally valuable, but much smaller and much less known art collection. Today, large parts of both collections are no longer under the roof of this building. Um, the collections or big parts of the collections have been sold in auctions after the death of its owner. The building, however, remained until today almost unchanged. It is part of the cultural and architectonical cultural heritage of the German Jews who came to the Mandate of Palestine during the Nazi era. Thank you very much.